welcome to the discussion on the future of nuclear energy, uh, organized by Idaho National Laboratory, obviously. Um, thank you all for coming. I know you're busy. I appreciate your time. Uh, my name is Nicole Stricker. I am the manager of science communications at Idaho National Laboratory, and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, so many of you are aware we've had a, a couple of these types of interactive panel Q&A discussions in the past. Those have focused uh, God, that's loud. on, on uh, nuclear energy accidents, but this time we wanted to look toward the future. Uh, nuclear energy has been in the news a lot lately, and there's a real renewed interest in clean energy from utility operators, state and national governments, average citizens, and even environmental groups that have traditionally been opposed to nuclear energy. Uh, as you may know, INL is playing a central role in the efforts to deploy advanced reactors. And so we have some experts here today to talk about the latest developments. Uh, the, the, you can scan the QR code on the TV screen to see bios of these panelists here today, as well as those who will be participating in future sessions. Um, first, I just want to set the stage by um, saying that we want this to be an interactive experience. We don't want this to be a lecture. We're very interested to hear your questions and, and have our experts answer them as, as to the best of their ability. So please take a moment to follow the instructions on the screen for accessing Poll EV. That's our, our interactive polling system, and that's going to let you vote on which questions you're most interested in having the panelists answer. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have. And you'll also um, get a chance to ask, to raise your hand and, and ask other questions that might, be, might not be represented on screen. Uh, so the, the first thing that we'll do is um, create a word cloud based on your thoughts right now coming into this panel about nuclear energy. So take a moment to type in what the first word that comes to your, your mind about nuclear energy when you hear that term. And while you do that, we'll take a few minutes for you to meet our panelists. Each of these panelists has expertise in a number of areas. I will note that they don't speak for advanced reactor developers or for the Department of Energy. They're just here to share their expert opinions based on their research and experience. So first at the far end of the table, Sam Reese is here to talk a bit about INL's partnerships with private industry. Um, next to Sam, Abdallah Abuzade uh, can talk about integrated energy systems, uh, how we use nuclear energy for something other than electricity, as well as how developers engage with communities. Um, next to Abdullah, Katja LeBlanc can address some of your questions about the Carbon Free Power Project, which is the new scale small modular reactor that will be built on the INL site. And next to me, John Jackson can talk about micro reactors and their applications. Um, so, uh, we'll take a minute and look at the word cloud. It seems like already a lot of you are, uh, the first word that comes to mind with nuclear energy is safe. So we have a pretty um, educated audience here. Uh, clean is, is another one that comes to mind. So that's really great to see. We will do another word cloud at the end of this session and see if anything you learned here today changed your, your first instincts about nuclear energy. Uh, so in the meantime, we'll go ahead and move to the first set of questions that relate to INL's partnerships with private industry. Um, so Sam Maurice, I'm going to give you a, a few minutes to introduce yourself and, and talk about what you do with INL and your expertise in this area. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Sam Maurice. I've been at the lab just over a year, so I'm far from an expert. but. Uh, Prior to this, I, I worked at 3M. At the end of that time there, I, I did some work on isotope separation, which uh, led me to working with companies like TerraPower and others in the molten salt space, where you need some of these specialty materials. Uh, this eventually led me here uh, to INL. I'm a program manager with ENRIC, the National Reactor Innovation Center. 
So with Enric, I, I work with a number of companies. Uh, forefront of those would be BWXT, who has a, a tier two award under their, uh, the ARDP programs, the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Programs. Uh, they're doing an irradiation out at ATR, uh, the uranium nitride triso, a novel fuel form in the silicon carbide matrix. I work with Oklo, who has aspirations of doing both fuel fabrication and reactor demonstration out at MFC. Uh, I also do some work with the molten salt thermophysical examination capability, a hot cell being built out at MFC to do qualification of molten salt fuels. And finally, I do some work with uh, resource teams under the NREG program, which is 200 hours of SME support. Dahl's done some of this. Uh, where we uh, support uh, reactor developers by giving them 200 hours of SME time at different national labs, not only at INL, but ANL, PNNL, LA, uh, Los Alamos, um, others, basically to do uh, work, uh, work that isn't otherwise funded by national programs or by the government. So, Happy to talk to you all about public-private partnerships and how the lab works with these companies. And thank you, Sam. And SME work, you mean subject matter experts? Yeah, I should probably not use as many acronyms. <laughs> I'm using subject matter experts at the different national labs. Thank you. Well, Sam, it seems like the um, question most people are interested in hearing more about is what kinds of projects are attracting investors right now? Sure. Should I keep using the microphone? Am I loud enough? It, the microphone's yeah. beneficial? Okay, cool. Um, so I, I think a lot of it, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think what it seems like a lot of uh, investors want to see is demonstrations, right? Uh, it's all good and fun, and it's all good fun and games, but uh, at the end of the day, they want to see reactors demonstrated so we can get to first of a kind and nth of a kind plants out in the wild here. So uh, this slide's good. I, I can't speak to all of these, but you can see here at least a smattering of, of the different developers that are working here at INL. I'm most familiar with BWXT, who has a gas-cooled reactor. Um, and I, I'm sure Katya will talk about this a little bit too with, with some of the, the work she's doing. But I, I think you know what we're seeing here is investors want to see demonstrations. Demonstrations will start with small modular reactors in the light water space. Reactors are light water reactors today. Uh, companies like BWXT and, and uh, X Energy have aspirations of gas cooled reactors, different coolant, right? So there's a little bit more that goes into that. I think those will be in the near future, probably not as immediate as the demonstrations from uh, the light water reactor folks. Things like natrium with uh, sodium cooled reactors and liquid metal reactors, kind of at the same time you're going to see gas cooled reactors. And then off in the distance there you can see things like, um, I don't know if McCree's on there or others, but uh, molten salt reactors, right? Where you're, you're changing a lot, you're in a fast spectrum, you're very high temperature. Uh, but what, that's what investors are really interested in seeing is these things being built. But uh, I, I think what a lot of people like to ignore is there's a long path to that, right? Especially with fuel qualification. That's what a lot of the work under a lot of these ARDP programs is aimed at. Um, you're not gonna, the NRC is not gonna let you, well, DOE might let you do a reactor with less fuel qualification, but at the end of the day, you need fuel qualification, you need to prove your fuel is safe, and you need to show that your reactor is safe to demonstrate, and you can't go straight to the reactor demonstration without that. Cool, thank you. Um, any questions from the audience on this topic of, um, what, uh, of, of how we can engage with industry? Any follow-up questions before we go to the next poll? Anyone? Don't be shy. Do you sense any kind of change in industry's attitude towards uh, advanced nuclear? Um, has there been any evolution? Yeah, the change in industry's sort of attitude towards advanced nuclear. Are you talking about the nuclear industry specifically, or just industry as a whole, and you know, investors and everyone beyond that? The nuclear industry. The nuclear industry. I, I think people see opportunity now. I think people see opportunity where they maybe didn't see opportunity previously, right? With carbon emissions becoming a, a huge talking point, and even, I mean, in, in more immediate terms with the current situation around natural gas and baseload power and um, the, the current situation in Eastern Europe. Uh, I think all of a sudden this, this idea that, you know, uh, austerity, the lights might not turn on, you have to limit your heat, this sort of stuff. I think, you know, the immediate, the very immediate situation draws a lot of um, hope from the industry that people will value nuclear. And I think even previous to that, I think the, the, the ARDP awards the advanced reactor demonstration proposals from DOE and just the amount of public-private partnerships being pushed right now has, I think, made the industry more optimistic, at least my two cents. Anyone else comments on that? Sam, another question people are interested in hearing about is how does INL specifically work with uh, some of these nuclear energy developers? 
Sure, I guess you're not sick of hearing from me yet. Um, so INL does a lot of things, right? I mean, I think, in my mind at least, the crown jewel of INL is ATR. Um, there's not a lot of test reactors out in the world, right? And the ability to be able to put your fuel or material in a reactor is rare, and it's tough to do. And a lot of these reactors are international, right? So for US-based companies, the ability to come to INL use ATR uh, and do these irradiations. I mean, it's not cheap or quick, but there's a lot of people lining up to do it, right? And take, for example, with BWXT, we're going into the Northeast flux trap. There's four flux traps in ATR. It's a hotly contested space right now. There's a lot of programs that want these high neutron sources and want to be able to test their materials and fuels and do it quickly, right? On, on an acceleration factor, you know, tens to hundreds of times faster than you would do um, in other sorts of neutron sources. So. I think ATR is huge. I mean, I think when you couple that with MFC and the ability to uh, take that irradiated fuel, not have to transport it across the country, be able to quickly and hopefully efficiently and within some sort of budget and timeline, you know, do that post-radiation examination work. Uh, the ability to do that all in one location is very key. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll do my little NRIC plug here. I do think there's a lot of work at INL to show that, um, you know, we may be a government institution, but we understand the pressures, the time constraints, the cost constraints that private industry faces, and we can work within those. So I think the ability to have kind of this, this infrastructure at the lab, and then folks who understand the pressures that companies are subjected to, and the timelines that they're subjected to, and the risks they're forced to undertake because of these things, and work with them on that, um, I think that's, at least in my mind, why I've seen companies interested in coming to work with us. Interesting, thank you. You find yourself going out to the companies a lot or them come to you mostly? That's a good question. Maybe Kachi can follow up. For me, I've, I've only been on this for a little bit. BWC has been out here a couple times. They've been coming out here mostly. Um, you know, I think we might go out there. They have uh, fuel fabrication lines, things like that. I think for some of our design reviews, we'll head out there. But primarily, I mean, the work happens here, and they, they want to see how that happens. So they, they do come here quite a bit. Oklahoma's been here a few times. I've, you know, I haven't gotten anywhere fun. I'll say that much. And I think a spin to that question is, do you, are, are, are you, is INL out trying to attract collaborations with these companies and these developers, or are they calling us up, cold calling us, saying, we, we need your help? Any, Any of you. Does anyone else want to head? Yep. Yeah, so, so um, I would add that, that this, this has been, been an evolution, an evolution of, of interaction. I happen to have started with the GAIN initiative um, um, seven years ago now, and, and Lori and I were really at the forefront of, of that, and, and it really represented a, a push to, to engage the private sector and really help them to understand the incredibly unique and expertise and infrastructure that exists within the lab complex. And GAIN remains to this day a conduit. Um, so I would say things have evolved over time. You know, initially people were very timid about approach. You know, a lot of people would say, I had no idea I could access the National Laboratory. And it's like you're screaming, my God, this is a taxpayer funded resource. We exist for your benefit. I think that realization is setting in and people are taking advantage of it. Awesome. Anyone else? I'll just add that it's, um, it really depends on the, uh, the area of, of need that they have. So in human factors, they're, they're less likely to come ask for help they have um, in the past. Um, but and in another area that I work in, in cybersecurity, we're going to them trying to see what they need, and they're still trying to figure it out. So I think it depends on, on the, the actual area they're working in. Super, thank you. Um, if there's any other, I think we have time for maybe one more question about engaging with industry. If you don't have any, we'll move on to the next sort of topic. I have a question about investors. I would like to, I would like to understand more about what type of investors are just interested in that. If it's some kind of like uh, venture capital funds, is that exactly what we are talking about? What kind of investors are we, are we talking about? It's a really good question. I, I think it varies a bit, so I can only, you know, talk from my experience. You know, like, I, I think my, if I compare and contrast BWXT and Oklo, right? So BWXT had a reactor design. They had shopped it out. I think there's small communities that want small modular reactors to power them. Um, but, you know, from a, from a 
uh, investor standpoint, BWXT is just a public-private partnership with BWXT and DOE, right? Because BWXT is a big monolith of the nuclear industry. They've been around a while. They have a lot of backing funds to do a lot of this. You know, they can fund 50% of the program themselves, look to DOE to do the other 50%. Um, and then you look at OGLO, right, based out of uh, California, you know, venture capitalist hotbed. They, they are purely venture capital funded, right? So they're uh, funding this completely out of pocket on uh, fuel manufacturing and reactor demonstration. They have a lot of folks from like Y Combinator and some of these other kind of venture capitalist hotbeds who are parts of their board or other parts of their organization or advisors. Um, so at least in my experience, uh, you know, I think some of these bigger, older companies have, have more opportunity there. I, I can't speak a lot for like, you know, X Energy and some of these newer companies that, you know, they do have these DOE partnerships, but they don't have this, you know, they don't have the nuclear navy buying their fuel like BWXT does to fund the background. So I'm, I'm unsure on those ones, and then be happy to get back to you with an answer on that where a lot of that funding is coming from. Wonderful. Thank you for the questions. Um, so we'll go ahead and move to the next topic now, which I believe is micro reactors. So while you look at those questions and, and vote on what you're most interested in learning about first, uh, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to John Jackson and ask him to, to introduce himself and tell you all a little bit about his expertise and role at IADL. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Um, as Nicole said, my name is John Jackson. I, in, interestingly, I've been at INL for almost 17 years now. Um, having come to INL from the oil industry, I was a drilling engineer at ExxonMobil. Um, so switching from petroleum to, to nuclear, um, <clears throat> I really got my start with the nuclear science user facilities and, and starting from that position as the industry program interface, um, I, I tend to focus on opportunities to, to you know, as I suggested before, utilize the, the unique capability and infrastructure. Like like Sam mentioned, ATR is a great example that I constantly pull out of my, my hat. You know, when people ask, what, what do we mean by unique infrastructure? Um, not everybody has an ATR in their backyard, nor should they. Um, I, I, I did the, NS, the nuclear science user facilities work for um, about five years. Uh, and then jumped to GAIN in, in 2016 um, when, when GAIN was first um, formulated. I think Lori preceded me by about a month and a half or two months. <laughs> um, but, but it was a very exciting time you know, uh, to run with the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear. Uh, and then most recently, uh, about two years ago now, I was asked by Jess Jean to, to take over the, as the National Technical Director for the Department of Energy's uh, Microreactor Research and Development Program, which has been quite a ride. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, it seems like the most popular question, just like yesterday, was uh, can microreactors really make a dent in carbon emissions? So, so the answer is, is a little complex. Um, if you take a microreactor in isolation and, and, and expect it to, to, to solve the carbon problem, you're, you're misled. Um, it's really a combination, and microreactors are, are, a, are, a, are a class of small modular reactor, but there's really a place for all types of reactors. There's a place for gigawatt scale reactors to power, you know, in, in close proximity urban centers. There's a place for small modular reactors for, for areas that, that uh, maybe don't have, that can't handle a gigawatt scale uh, electrical output, um, but also may want, want um, co-production co of, of process heat as well as electricity. And then you have microreactors, which also have a special role to play. Initially, at least, microreactors are envisioned to be deployed in remote um, areas of the country or in, in, in disaster relief scenarios. The key here is with, with microreactors, for me particularly, is, is the word agility. If you think of a nuclear reactor, you don't necessarily throw out the word is agile, but, but relative to gigawatt scale or small modular reactor scale, microreactors are what I would consider agile, meaning, and, and it's in their very definition, the definition that we adhere to for microreactors are that they're factory fabricated, they're transportable, and they're self-regulating, which implies simplicity, which implies low cost of operation. So 
The other thing I would point out is, is not to lose sight of the fact that there are other forms of clean energy that work in coordination with microreactors. Typically, microreactors will be deployed as part of something called a microgrid, uh, which, would, which could include solar, photovoltaic, and, and other forms of, of battery storage. So um, if you ask if microreactors can solve the carbon problem in and of themselves, I would say no. But, but in coordination with all the other forms of clean energy, um, microreactors are certainly a, a critical part of the solution. Awesome. Thank you. Any questions from the audience related to microreactors? Julie. Sure. So, so as far as um, kind of placement of microreactors, I know you know there's there's people who are looking to make their own you know homes more energy efficient. We're not talking about like you putting one of these in your backyard, but this would go in certain areas. Uh, can you talk a little more about that? I mean, it's not like you're putting solar panels on your roof and you can get a microreactor at that scale, right? Why not? <laughs> well, my question is, is this in the future, right? No, we're, we're not quite there yet. The answer is, is really that, you know, the, the first few off the assembly line are going to be clunky. There's no doubt about it. We're not going to expect to have a, a full technical solution for microreactors. We're in a race against time. We've got to deploy these, but, but economy comes with, with experience. And so initially, I, as I su suggested, these would be deployed in remote locations like Alaska, where the cost of diesel fuel sometimes tops $20 a gallon in combination with the complex operation of getting it to the place it needs to go. Uh, so you imagine a microreactor powering a remote community um, and not needing maintenance or fueling for five to 10 years, that, that's astronomically game changing. As we evolve and we get from first to tenth of a kind to say twentieth or hundredth of a kind, these will be, become refined technology and, and we'll find the economy and, and you'll start to see them deployed in more resilient cities, for instance. Um, and there is a dream that we'll have something called a fission battery that you can that you actually could have in your backyard. But that's not I'm I'm never gonna sit here and tell you that that's tomorrow. <laughs> what about data centers? Is that another market for microreactors? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, maybe not initially because because we, we need to again evolve the technology. Um, but but you know certainly and, I, and here I'll reference the marble microreactor that we're building here at Idaho and everybody should be proud of that's that's, that's part of the Idaho National Laboratory. Um, we will demonstrate that capability, uh, connectivity to a microgrid and, and powering of things like data centers. Sam, did you have something to add? I was, yeah, I mean just like kind of auxiliary to that, but I think that's an interesting change right now. Nuclear is. Uh, um, Maybe some folks here are aware, but X Energy signed an agreement with Dow Chemical. I don't know if it was a memorandum of understanding or I forget exactly the type of agreement. But it's to cite a nuclear reactor that would, I don't know if it would be owned or operated by Dow, but it's not like a public utility. It's to power chemical plants, right, and, and reduce the emissions of those chemical plants along the, in the Gulf area. Um, so I, I think there is an interesting paradigm shift, not just for micro reactors, but small modular reactors in general and their ability to, you know, be incorporated into industrial processes, local communities. It's, I don't know. It's a bit of a different paradigm, I think, than what we've seen with conventional nuclear. Well, Nola was talking about um, working with Bitcoin, and, and, and which is highly consumptive of energy. Yeah, no, I, and we talk with them, but I mean, I think there's a lot of interest, not, you know, Bitcoin data center, et cetera, that's like a pretty disruptive industry as a whole. And, you know, they're moving, you know, right now they're already moving into things like liquid immersion cooling and all these sorts of, you know, paradigm shift technologies from a baseline. And I think they're, industries like that, at least in my experience and what I've seen, my two cents, they seem to be a bit more open-minded to the idea of a nuclear reactor nearby powering them versus, I mean, it, it is impressive to me that an old, you know, a historic company like Dow would be, you know, involved in that as well. But I think some of these newer, uh, fast, more agile industries uh, maybe are a little more open to the paradigm. Yeah, just as another example, um, there's been a lot of thought put toward decarbonizing steel making, which is a massive carbon producer. Um, and and microreactors are thought to pair well with that. So. It, I would say use your imagination, and, and there is a way to apply uh, microreactor SMR. And can you say, John, um, 
Uh, about are there any specific entities that today are interested in potentially bringing a microreactor um, to help them lower their carbon footprint? Sure. Um, another uh, accomplishment for INL is, is INL is hosting the DOD's Pele react, microreactor. Um, this was a competitively awarded microreactor. It's, it's uh, being built by BWXT. Um, but Pele uh, represents a DOD application, which is another ap application space where, where microreactors will be initially deployed. The Air Force has, has an RFP, a re request for proposal out um, to solicit uh, a power purchase agreement from, from a microreactor vendor um, to, to again uh, power a, a, for, uh, a base, an Air Force base. Um, I get calls about once a month from somebody asking, "How does this stuff work, and, and, and when can we when can we see one?" That's exciting. So it's not just nuclear engineers' dream at this point. Is there interest from <coughs> other countries, and, and, and in particular third world countries? Um, absolutely. Um, I, yeah, this, this 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 is a global this is a global evolution. Uh, the United States is, is not the only country developing microreactor technology. We want to win, which is what we're going to do with Marvel and Pele. Um, and, and there are many reasons for that, but, but you're, you're right, Paul. Um, there are other, uh, other countries developing these, and there are other countries interested in, in purchasing um, from, from the U.S. developers. Thank you. Um, so we'll go ahead and move on just to keep us on schedule to our next topic, uh, which is how uh, we at INL and nuclear developers engage with communities. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Abdallah, who can talk a little bit about uh, his expertise and work in this area while you, while you vote on your questions. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Abdallah Bujaude. Uh, I wear a lot of different hats at INL. Uh, somebody made the joke that it's easier to say what I don't work on than what I do work on at the lab. Um, just to give you a quick overview, I've been here for five years. Uh, I started out as one of the first distinguished postdocs at the lab, uh, Delon de Bois Blanc. I'm saying it in French, but I think it's a French name, an American name, though. So I think it's Deslon de Bois Blanc, <laughs> is how you should be pronouncing it. Anyhow, um, so I've been working uh, among the different hats I wear. One is on molten salt reactor technology. As Sam mentioned, there's the McCree project being deployed. Uh, at INL, I work on uh, the confirmatory analysis for that. I'm leading some salt irradiation projects. It'll be, ho we're hoping to be the first chloride salt to ever be irradiated. People have irradiated other types of salts, but not fueled chloride salts in the past. We're in a race with Ohio State currently. Um, and then I do a lot of bonding and simulation work, both for molten salt reactors and also beyond. So I'm actually setting up some scope with John Jackson here on micro reactor modeling and simulation. We're trying to model the Marvel reactor using INL's uh, f advanced capability, it's called the Moose framework, it's for multi-physics simulation. And then lastly, uh, one of my third big hats I wear is on techno-economics, so trying to understand how what, what driving the cost for nuclear reactors. I spent most of my career doing reactor physics and thermohydraulics and I quickly realized that money talks, it's not the neutronics, it's not thermohydraulic, it's ultimately money that's going to make a decision if we build a reactor or not. So I do work with John again on uh, trying to see if we can learn some things from Marvel in terms of cost of advanced reactors, what's going to be the driving uh, areas where we're going to need to do some more R&D to drive down these costs, how can we learn, how can we produce them in a factory, uh, what about the supply chain, how, what's that going to look like, and through that work I also work with the integrated energy system and I'll probably talk about that a bit later on. Uh, but happy to answer any questions about engaging with communities and I'll probably have my colleagues here help uh, answer that too because I think they have quite a bit of experience in that space as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah, the, it looks like the first, the most popular question right now is how do developers uh, choose where to build a new nuclear energy plant? So there's a lot of factors that come into place. Obviously, the first thing is you need a, a, vent, a customer that's interested. Um, that's the first step. And now, uh, since uh, Sam brought it up, it could be a wide range of customers now. It's not only, only going to be the grid, it could be other uh, industrial uh, uh, entities in, interested in it uh, for decarbonization purposes, uh, data centers as well could be another avenue, uh, but first you have to find somebody that's interested in from a market standpoint. The second step is community engagement and regulatory engagement as well. Um, so obviously it's um, 
a lot better for, I now can't speak on behalf of vendors, of course, but it would be prudent for a vendor to engage very actively with the community before, uh, rather than just pushing a solution onto them. I think the nuclear industry hasn't had a great track record of doing that in the past, but I think we were learning a lot from that. If you guys are following the news about Natrium in Wyoming, uh, they've had a range of, of uh, coal mines, uh, coal, coal factories, sorry, um, they considered as part of their um, decision to host a site for their advanced reactor plant. And then they had engagement with all these different communities to see who was essentially most keen to host them, had a lot of public outreach opportunities, and ultimately decided on the Kremer site. Uh, one of the key reasons was community engagement and enthusiasm from the local community in hosting a site there. And then lastly is, is on the regulatory side. Of course, you can't just build a reactor anywhere. Uh, there are regulatory constraints in terms of flooding risk, seismic risk. You can generally address them by doing some detailed engineering analysis, but there are sites that are obviously not suitable for a nuclear power plant and something to be aware of. Um, Anyone else want to comment on this question? I was just going to add one small thing. I, I recently attended, I don't know if any of you folks were there, there was the Energy Community Alliance Conference in Salt Lake. And one of the interesting things that I guess I, maybe I should have expected, but it was an interesting learning there is they did a lot of panels of communities who were hosting advanced nuclear work. And uh, it, I mean, other than Kemmer, which is a great example of a new community coming in because they realize the need to, they will wither and, and fade if they don't have a new replacement for their coal plants. But, you know, at least as, for these other communities, it's, it's historic nuclear communities, right? Communities around Oak Ridge, communities around PNNL and the, the Tri-Cities area up there. I forget if that's what you call it or not. Uh, but in, in areas around INL too, where historically, you know, there's been generational engagement. Their parents, grandparents, whoever worked on developing reactors, worked on building reactors, worked on fuel cycle work. It plays a big role in I, I guess the, the core of it is that knowledge from these communities about what the benefits of nuclear to those communities are makes it a lot easier for new nuclear reactors to come into those places. Thank you for that. Any questions from the audience on this topic of, of engaging with communities to site new nuclear? I guess I have kind of one. So I was at a conference a couple weeks ago at the Renewables um, Plus, and I talked to the gentleman from Hawaii and uh, we were talking about what they were using for their energy sources there on the island of Hawaii. And uh, I mentioned to him about microreactors and some of the microgrid work that was being done at INL. And one of the things that he had concern with was that he didn't think it would ever fly with the people of Hawaii to bring their microreactors there. And so it kind of does pose the question of what, I guess, what we need to do um, as INL employees, also as a community that's Engage those communities that are kind of in some ways far removed from what's happening here in Idaho. So I'll just paraphrase that while you all think about what who, who wants to answer and how. Uh, basically, uh, in speaking with people at a conference from Hawaii who grapple with very high fuel prices, they're potentially interested in nuclear but not sure that the population there would accept it. So how can we engage with communities who might be less familiar with nuclear? Is that clear? Here's where I toss in a pitch for Marvel. One of the very reasons we're, we're building Marvel, and, and Marvel, if you're not familiar with Marvel, um, is, is a microreactor application research validation and evaluation. Very small microreactor we're building um, with DOE funding. But it's really to answer that fundamental question of how do they act? Um, are they safe? You know, what, what, you know, it really, in, in this case, data talks, uh, just like money talks, data talks, uh, experience talks. Um, this is an opportunity to, to, to uh, build that experience database. Um, really, the proof is in the pudding for me in this. That's not to say we shouldn't be engaging you know, in using other means, but, but, but to me, that's going to be the strongest, most compelling argument is when you see it in operation and you, and you see absolutely there's no issue with this. Great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah, Della? Yeah, I guess I would add. Can you hear me? It's like, it looks like it's blinking. Is that a problem? <laughs> the battery might be dying. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I would just add uh, maybe two points. One is uh, 
community uh, perception changes a lot about nuclear. One key example I would point to is Diablo Canyon, where uh, as far as I was in the nuclear industry, everybody had written that off as never coming back. The Californians are very anti-nuclear. We're never going to see that reactor extend its life, life, uh, li- uh, licensing lifetime. And now, actually, there's been a lot of movement in the state to doing so. So one item I would say is never say never. So that's uh, when, when it comes to nuclear. The other item is how do we engage with community? And there's this whole fallacy of the, um, I think the, the term people coin is knowledge gap. In nuclear, we think that if we explain it enough and give you enough boring slides that you will be convinced that nuclear is the right solution and that's not really how anybody's convinced about anything. So if in a community like Hawaii, what we'd have to do is actually uh, activism, engaging with stakeholders, trying to build trust with people, uh, interacting with them, and trying to relate with what, what we have in common, which is generally clean energy, reliable energy, uh, energy security, those kinds of themes anybody can uh, relate to, and using that to make the case for nuclear rather than just talking at them about how nuclear is safe, etc. I love that. Thank you. Can you... Um <clears throat> Say a little bit about the risks and benefits of having a, a nuclear plant sited in one's community. What are the risks and benefits? So there's no risk whatsoever. <laughs> uh, so, so I guess uh, in terms of uh, safety, it, if, if that's what people are meaning by risk in this case, uh, there's extensive work done at uh, in the licensing stage to be able to mitigate all, if not every single risk, potentially possible. Typically, we talk about a one in a millionth chance of an accident happening in a nuclear power plant. That's the bar we have to set to ourselves in terms of making sure um, we, we, uh, we, we don't run into problems when we build a nuclear power plant. Um, there are also other, um, uh, shall we say, disadvantages which is challenges associated with nuclear energy. Waste is one that comes up a lot. However, we have proven that we can store in dry cask storage nuclear waste for half a century now. Um, so we, we're pretty confident that this scheme keep going and we're working towards geological repository. Some countries are further along than we are. A last type of risk is uh, proliferation, but that's, I think, maybe one we'll, we'll, we'll sidestep for now. It, it relates to this debate of if nuclear power could uh, encourage a state to develop a weapon. So that's kind of a debate in North Korea and in Iran, for instance. But it's not something that's very applicable here, so I'll skip that one. In terms of benefits, obviously the key one is uh, having clean, reliable energy. Uh, prices at the node, uh, at the electrical node for nuclear power plants are typically very low compared to other uh, places in the world. Uh, you, a lot of high paying jobs as well as a key item, I would say, for a community. Most communities are very supportive of a nuclear power plant. Up, we talk about up to 90% plus support for a nuclear power plant within the local community, just because it's it's they, they work there, everybody works there. It, it's a lifeblood for a lot of these communities. That's why we see a lot of uh, the coal uh, facilities being so upset about coal, ma- coal plants uh, shutting down because it's their livelihood of their community. And the same can be said for a nuclear power plant as a whole. Um, and then the last one is uh, getting engagement with the, the, the wider community as a whole. Having a power plant in your um, community brings a lot of top talent, uh, expertise, a wide range of different industries, and uh, increases your, your community's exposure, I would say. Wonderful. Thank you, Abdallah. And I think this is a perfect segue to our next um, topic area, which is the carbon-free power project, a, a, a small modular nuclear reactor that is proposed to be built at the INL site in our backyard. Uh, so I'll ask Katya LeBlanc to say a few words about what she does at INL and, and her familiarity with this project. Hi everyone, thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Katia Blanc and I'm a human factor scientist, so I'm actually a social scientist by education and trade. Um, and what we do is we try to understand how humans interact with systems. Um, my connection to the Carbon Free Power Project is through um, partnerships with NewScale. Uh, I've done, I worked with them pretty early in their uh, development of their human system interface because they were really concerned about how they're going to uh, address staffing. Um, Staffing in a typical nuclear power plant at a gigawatt scale is four operators on shift um, for the entire, for for the entire unit or the entire plant. Um, And if you have a 
12 unit small modular reactor where they're producing 75 uh, megawatts or so, um, you can't possibly support, it's not sustainable to have four operators for each of those 12 reactors. And so they understood very early on that human factors was one of their biggest challenges. And so they came to us and asked for, for help on um, essentially uh, demonstrating that their staffing model was uh, sufficient um, to meet a to, to meet the need of, of safe operation. Um, so we helped them with their um, their evaluation. Um, how do they measure how humans uh, are gonna perform in that context? Um, and then I also supported a, a little bit um, of additional work with them uh, moving forward um, in the partnership with, with INL um, for a proposed project where there was the potential to use one of their units for research, um, which is, is not uh, going forward, but uh, so we, uh, a lot of different work associated with New Scale Power, the uh, New Scale um, Power Module is what's been selected for the Carbon Free Power Project, which is one of the questions you're interested in, so I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, could you just, I guess we we're sort of evenly split on most popular question. Can you say a little bit, give a little bit more background <laughs> about what is this SMR project uh, plan for the INL site? So uh, New Scale, so the, the um, design plan for the carbon free power project is the New Scale Small Modular Reactor. A small modular reactor is essentially, you can build up, you can have multiple units, um, which are much smaller than a typical nuclear power plant, um, and uh, build up your capacity over time. Um, and so you don't have to build, you don't have to invest in the entire project, um, and there's other benefits to operating that way. Um, one of them is refueling, it simplifies refueling. Um, and so the typical new scale uh, plant would have 12 modules. Um, for the UAMPS, uh, the, the partnership, the Carbon Free Power Project is a partnership between UAMPS, new scale, and the Department of Energy. The, um, so UAMPS is a consortium of, um, of utilities uh, in this area. Um, and including Idaho Falls. Including Idaho Falls, yes. Um, so um, Idaho Falls Power is one of them. So those, uh, that partnership is going to op operate, uh, build and operate a six unit uh, plant out at the, uh, at potentially at the INL site. So, um, so that project is, uh, the new scale power modules have um, a lot of benefits and advantages um, to compared to a, a existing reactor that creates uh, gigawatts of power, um, they're much more flexible. Um, they can operate um, much more uh, safely and automatically. So they have a lot of passive safety features. Um, they have a lot fewer active components, which uh, reduce the amount of maintenance that's required, but also reduce the amount of things that can go wrong. Um, and I think some of the other benefits are. Uh, that the uh, new scale power module or the new scale plant um, can uh, increase reliability in a lot of different ways because they can they can start if, if they lose offsite power um, all of the uh, systems are designed to uh, be in a safe state so they don't require offsite power for most of the safety functions and then they can also support restart um, so if your uh, lose power the electric grid, there's a blackout, um, a nuclear plant um, is typically the last thing to come online because it needs power from the grid. Um, new scale power can uh, support black start, which is essentially starting from, uh, from nothing and, and supporting restart of the grid. Um, and so that has some regional um, uh, benefits to the community. Awesome, thank you. Um, and can, can Katja or any of you just say briefly what what makes the new scale reactor different from the other reactors operating at the INL site? So the reactors that are currently operating at the site are research reactors, as uh, was meant, as Sam mentioned, and others. Um, they're designed to uh, irradiate things, so uh, and so we can understand how different materials and different things um, behave once they've uh, been exposed to radiation. Um, so we can use them to design things, and lots of other applications as well. So those are all to support research. The New Scale uh, and UAMPS project, the Carbon Free Power Project, is specifically designed to, to produce power um, and send it off to the grid. Um, Perfect, thank you. 
Any other questions about the carbon-free power project from the audience? We have a couple minutes left on this topic. Is, um, with all the UAMPS utilities, um, is, it, is the carbon-free power project getting any better buy-in in Utah and Nevada? Because there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of people saying we just can't risk them, you know, putting our money into this. And that is actually a question that I don't, I don't think I can answer because I'm, I'm not directly connected with the utilities that are doing that. Um, if I, I did want to add to something about the benefits though, because I didn't, um, about of power, because we've been talking about coal um, and, and retirement of coal plants and retirement of coal. Um, there's one of the largest issues in electric utility, uh, if you're talking to an electric utility across the United States, is resource adequacy. So are we going to have enough generation capacity to actually meet the need? And this is specifically um, a, a challenge in extreme weather events like heat waves in the western United States or cold, uh, cold snaps in, in the south and uh, the, the eastern United States. Um, and so that's the biggest challenge. That's what everyone is concerned about. And as we talk about carbon-free power, um, you've got renewables, you've got hydro, um, and you've got wind and solar. And you can control hydro, but you can't control solar and wind. And if you're retiring coal plants, um, you absolutely have to have something to control. And so this is an opportunity to have a carbon-free power source that actually that you can dispatch and you can control um, that allows you to actually retire those coal plants effectively. So that's one huge benefit, and it's it, in, it it's one of the only ways that we can get to the carbon goals um, and also retire our fossil fuel plants. Yes, question. Can we reuse nuclear waste and put it back in to extract? Who wants to tackle the question about whether we can reuse spent nuclear fuel or nuclear waste and get more power out of it? Abdullah. That was my PhD thesis, actually. So, so the, 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 there's a... Uh, Two minute uh, <laughs> Five hour long presentation. No, so there's a, a, a different approaches for doing that. The main one, so this, okay, let me, very briefly. In France, they're already currently doing it. They use what's called mixed oxide fuel, so MOX, where they put it back in the pressurized water reactor, which is light water reactors we currently have, so we can do that already. The other route, which is what was demonstrated, the INL, the EBR2 reactor, if you guys see that shiny big dome, sometimes in pictures, that's what that was, uh, where you take down the waste, put it into a, uh, a, a power chemistry process, basically, so it just separates out some useful bits, some bad bits, so you can basically recycle up to 80% of the fuel and stick it back into a fast spectrum reactor, which just means that the neutrons are very high energy, not low energy neutrons. And there's currently new technologies now with molten salt reactors where you can just dissolve the fuel into a salt and put that in a reactor again. So yes, we, we've known how to do it, we've done it in the past. There are challenges though, one of them is economical, the other one is proliferation because a lot of that technology that you use to recycle the fuel can be used to separate out plutonium for weapon. And the US has a policy of not encouraging recycling anywhere. Uh, reprocessing anywhere because of that fear of other countries doing it for weapons purposes. Wonderful. Thank you for the question. Um, let's, is in the interest of time, oh, go ahead, Sam, sorry. Yeah, I mean, so for what Dahl was talking about, that, that EBR material, that's actually what Oklahoma wants to use in their reactor. We're in negotiations with DOE right now to, to actually reuse that. So it's already been turned back into ingots. There's seven kilogram ingots of HALU, 20%, less than 20%, 19.9% enriched. Uh, uranium, and yeah, uh, it, it has an impurity profile associated with it, but like Abdal said, fast reactor developers have, you know, a strong desire to use that. And yeah, molten salt reactors, I think, you know, can burn up 90% plus of their fuel, where light water reactors only use less than 10% of the usable enriched material in the fuel. So that's definitely a great long-term option, but even in the short term with what Oakla is trying to do, there's, there's a lot of interest in some of this spent nuclear material in the United States. Thank you for that, Sam. Um, let's go to our last topic of the day, I think, which is uh, what can nuclear energy do beyond making electricity? Um, there's some examples of, of some questions you might have there. Obviously, we can answer others, but this is, again, uh, Abdullah, I believe, is going to uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your expertise in this area of, of the lab and, and what you're prepared to, to speak to. Um, sure, I guess very briefly, um, 
there's a campaign going on at uh, the Department of Energy level called the Integrated Energy Systems Campaign, and their primary primary focus area is on uh, co-generation of electric of things beyond electricity. So what can we do beyond just providing electricity to the grid? Uh, John mentioned also the grid is now also a very loose term in nuclear as well. We're, we're looking at microgrids as well, uh, data centers look being one of them. Sam mentioned Dow Chemical uh, for cogeneration of heat. That's one area. Uh, personally, I've worked with uh, one utility in the Midwest in terms of uh, advising them on hydrogen cogeneration uh, as part of their plant. And right now I'm working with the campaign on developing better cost models for advanced reactors so they can build into their framework where they're modeling how you dispatch electricity and how you switch from co-generating, say, hydrogen to powering the grid when renewables aren't, winds are blowing, sun isn't shining, and you need electricity in the grid desperately. Um, so that's kind of a high level. Okay, thank you. Um, so can, can you explain to us a little bit, Abdullah, about what is what exactly is nuclear hydrogen and why does it matter? Why are we hearing so much about it lately? So it's not fusion, although <laughs> well, that could be uh, mis mistaken, but it's uh, w what's called green hydrogen that's produced from a nuclear power plant. So you use the energy from a nuclear power plant to synthesize hydrogen, and then you can use it in all sorts of different applications. So in the past, people get kind of bogged down in hydrogen space in terms of talking about changing all of our cars to the hydrogen fuel cell batteries. That's not currently what we're talking about, at least for the hydrogen market. Right now, it's mainly st things like uh, steel refining, like what uh, uh, John mentioned before, ammonia production for fertilizers and other applications. There's even talks about using it for uh, some level of transportation, so uh, trucks, uh, potential boats, that sort of things uh, as a whole. But the key thing for nuclear hydrogen is it's just completely carbon free and it's produced by a nuclear power plant there. Okay, thank you. Other questions about integrated energy systems? Joel. Are there any large scale uh, demonstrations or plans to look at desalination through nuclear heat? Yeah, that already exists. So Diablo Canyon is actually one I was oh, mentioning earlier. Yeah, right. yeah, it's a desalination <laughs> plant as well. Uh, there's also a bunch of cases uh, elsewhere in the world. There are instances of even district heating using nuclear power plants, so even just heating up your homes instead of converting nuclear energy to electricity and then back into heat, you just ship the heat basically to the end user. That's been done in the past. Um, and, and yet there's ongoing efforts as well in all these areas. Like my colleagues are working with Arizona Public Services, uh, where you can imagine in Arizona there's a big lack of water uh, there. So desalination is a very big topic for that power plant there in Palo Verde, uh, using nuclear heat uh, desalination. Abdullah, can you explain a little bit more about how we could harness the heat from um, nuclear reactors? How does uh, that work? So there, it's a very open-ended question. There's several ways of doing that. Obviously, the, 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 the most common way right now is to convert that into a turbine, uh, sorry, to drive a turbine, and that, that will be what creates electricity. So that's the traditional way, but since the topic is beyond electricity, there are a bunch of other uh, avenues. The main thing is a lot of chemical processes require very high temperature applications, so you need to have temperatures above uh, you know, 300 C or uh, degrees Celsius, sorry. Um, so very high temperatures to accelerate or catalyze, say, chemical reaction or some kind of uh, manufacturing process. And so you'd have to transport that heat through a fluid, so through gas or water, even steam, uh, salt, say, and uh, provide it to the end user so that they could use it for their purposes as well. This nuclear also has been used for propulsion, so we, a lot of our submarines and uh, aircraft carriers use nuclear energy for propulsion the feed, and then there's talks about, I have also done a project on converting, uh, looking into converting maritime shipping industry, which is a big CO2 emitter, and they don't have an easy solution, you can't really easily electrify them, so nuclear propulsion could be a solution there as well. Interesting. We have time for one more question on this topic. Does anyone have any last burning questions about integrated energy systems or anything else we've talked about today or anything related to the future of nuclear energy? Well, while you think about that, um, I guess we'll put up yeah, our final word cloud. So knowing what you know now and based on conversa our conversations, um, what word comes to mind when you hear nuclear energy? Maybe it's the same as it was when you came in, maybe it's different. Um, but we invite you to, to share your thoughts on that. Um, we're just about out of time. I'm really happy everyone was able to come today. You'll see there's a survey on your chair. 
Uh, there'll also be a QR code at the end if you want to save some paper. We would really love your feedback about this session, uh, about if you are interested, have topics of interest for future sessions, um, <coughs> what we can do better, what you learned, any feedback that you care to provide will really help us refine how we approach this. Any last questions, thoughts, comments before we let you all get back to your work days? Yes, there is a big plate of cookies in the back, so please take one or two for yourselves and your coworkers. Any thoughts from the panel? Yes, John. I'm just going to take the opportunity to point out that over the next two days, we will have a Marvel technology review. So if you're burning <laughs> up to know more about Marvel and, and its technical progress and how it will be utilized, um, there, it is a uh, virtual meeting. Um, email Lori uh, Brazi or <laughs> or Teresa Kraniki for me. That's right. And there, there's um, in the promotion for this event, there was the nuclear questions email you can send to there as well if you're not sure how to reach any of these people and we'll get your, um, get your inquiries to them. Thank you for that. Katja? I just want to go back to a long a question that came up a long time ago about how do we engage the community, especially people who come to us concerned about um, nuclear power. And one of the things that I've, I've said before, but I feel very strongly, is that you have to go to those people with humility. And so I'm sorry, Abdallah, saying things like there are no risk. Um, I know you were joking, but those kinds of things, I think, turn people off because there are risks. I mean, everyone knows that they exist, and so I think we have to um, be very, very, we have to be cognizant of them, and then do exactly what you said. Um, describe how we're mitigating them, uh, describe the benefits of the technology, and like really be an ambassador for, for describing those things with, with humility, though, because um, I think acknowledging that, yes, there are absolutely, if they, they're worried about waste or water or safety, those things are, they exist, and unfortunately, we, we mitigate them very effectively, but we, they, they do exist. I appreciate that very much, and, and that's part of why I, I very much want to thank the panel for being here, to listen to your questions and answer them, and for you all to be here to ask questions. I think that's a big part of helping build those bridges is, is by listening to each other. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, I think the next slide, yeah, there's a QR code for the survey if you wanna save paper, but please do give us your feedback. Thank you.